So there's three main ways to meet buyers across all categories. The first is there's things called brokers. Brokers are people who have their ear to the ground on the up and coming brands and they kind of soft pitch you the buyers up front. And so that's what happened when I launched is a couple of brokers reached out and said, hey, I actually know that this buyer is looking for a brand that's doing exactly what you're doing. Do you want me to soft pitch them on your behalf? What does it take to get your product on the shelves at major retailers like Target and Walmart? Well, you're in luck because today's guest has been a buyer for many years and now has created a product of her own that she's been able to get on shelves at Target. So if you're interested in hearing how she did that, keep on listening. Hi there, it's Sewa, and welcome to another episode of the She's Off Script podcast. For today's episode, we meet Jasmine. As I mentioned, she's been a buyer for many years at Amazon, Target, General Mills. And now that she has her own product, it's called Be Rooted. It's a stationary company that's inclusively designed. So if you would like to hear hear the steps she went through to get her products at Target. Keep on listening. We're going to be talking about how to find buyers, how to get their attention, how to stay on shelves, how she got her influencer strategy together, and so much more. So if you think this will be helpful for you as you create your own brand, keep on watching. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next episode. All right, let's go ahead and jump in. Jasmine Foster, welcome to She's Soft Script. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So for any of our listeners who haven't heard of you, could you share who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I um, am a long-term lover of retail. I spent most of my career background either growing, developing, or coming up with inclusive assortment strategies for some of your favorite major retailers like Target and Amazon. Um, And I am also now the founder and owner of Be Rooted, which is an inclusively designed stationary brand created to uplift and celebrate women of color. So how did you initially get into the retail buying space? Yeah, so I was a business marketing major at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. And um, I always thought I was going to be one of those people that went into advertising and I was going to move to New York and come up with amazing commercials. And then I found out that Target was coming on campus to talk about the retail path. And after chatting with them a little bit, I was like, wait, like there's people that actually make the decision behind what ends up in stores. Like I never really thought about all the upfront work that had to go into that. And I was like, that's really cool. Like I can get to pick what goes on shelves, what, you know, people get to see me amazing brands and also like make a decent amount of money and not have to live in New York with like four roommates in a small, like 200 square foot apartment. So Ooh, I know that's right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of stumbled upon um, that path through an internship opportunity and then fell in love with retail from there. So I feel like working in that retail buying space, you were uniquely positioned not only to learn from the emerging brands you're working with, but also to see the gaps in the market. So why was stationary the gap that you chose to fill? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. The One of the last jobs that I had was I led the multicultural beauty strategy and also lo- led the multicultural doll strategy. And so I was able to see firsthand the impact of having inclusive assortment strategies um, and the white space that like, it just is crazy to believe that we've gotten to be this far and there were still products that weren't for everyone's hair type and for everyone's complexion and skincare Mm. that didn't work for dark spots and just like all of these gaping, glaring holes. And one area that I always asked if I could work on was home. Like when I walked the home aisles of Target, um, you know, in all of your major retailers, when I looked back at like what my homes look like, Mm -hmm. I never felt like there was really that one brand that got my aesthetic that was really speaking to me. Mm. And at the time I was asked to just focus on dolls and beauty, but it was something that really stuck with me. Um, I've always been a long time lover of stationery, but when you look at the category, it's usually very whimsical and cute, but the wording is just like, slightly off to what maybe what me and my friends would use. And then if Mm -hmm. there was ever anyone adorning the cover, she didn't look like me. And so I wanted to create a brand that felt really truly and truly authentic to me, myself and my community and that for young girls to be able to connect with. Now, from the background you've described, 
you clearly weren't in the production space. So how did you make the leap from having the idea and seeing the gap to actually executing? I think when I first came across you, you had a spiral journal and stickers. So Mm -hmm. how does one even go about producing those things? (laughs) Yeah, that's a really good question because it's, people will tell you, oh, you can just Google, but like Google doesn't give you all of the answers by any means. Um, When I first started off, there was a lot of trial and error. So it was finding um, factories or producers that could produce to the specs and the qualities I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And I found that domestically, there really wasn't the printers that could produce the type of quality that I was looking for. And so when I got that is, that's an emerging theme I hear from a lot of founders is we went straight to Asia. Yeah. You know, I think that there's certain industries that have been historically in the United States. And so there's been lots of investment in technology and manpower behind them. Mm. And then there's certain industries where there's not. So for example, beauty, beauty, you can absolutely find your, your uh, manufacturer here in the U S there's tons of amazing uh, chemists and labs here that like produce really high quality formulas here in the U S you may get Mm. packaging overseas, but you can produce beauty products really well here. I find that at least in the paper industry, a lot of paper printing and packaging happens in Asia. And since the majority of my product is paper-based, as I was able to scale, I ended up um, needing to leverage the expertise of where the majority of paper printing was happening. And so that's how I ended up finding a supplier in China. Now, I've heard you talk about the importance of leveraging your network. So were you able to leverage not only your network, but perhaps even some of the founders that you had worked with as a retail buyer in order to kind of navigate those initial steps? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was super blessed with, I had a friend of mine who also happened to be my soror who was in the stationary industry. And uh, when I was looking to expand abroad, I was able to leverage her network to ask her, hey, has, have you, you know, who's the factory that you really trust and that you loved working with? And she was able to pass along a couple of names mm. to people that she had worked with. And had I had not had that initial kind of connection, I'm sure I would have been able to find somebody at some point. But at the moment in time that I needed it, um, having that network is so important, but even just small things throughout the process of me, you know, needing to work on my P and L and wondering if, you know, who had a, a, you know, a really good CFO outsource mm-hmm. CFO that worked with, or, Hey, I'm considering doing this, you know, what, how would you approach it? I've leveraged my network so deep. And I think it's so important to be, not be afraid to ask those questions because they help you make less mistakes. You're going to make mistakes, but they mm-hmm. help you make less mistakes up front. Yep. You've got to shortcut it however possible. Um, And I mentioned, I I think I came across you either on Instagram or on Google, but when I Google your brand today, there's already a lot of media about you. What was your media and influencer strategy for increasing that brand awareness? Because clearly that has made a great impact for your brand. (laughs) Yeah. um, Well, thank you so much for saying that. It's so funny that you said that you can Google and find my brand because if we were this time last year, if you Googled and tried to find my brand, that was not the case. Um, Truthfully, from all of my years of being in retail, I would have told a brand, hey, like spend the first year to really owning your audience, you know, develop your social network, build up an email list, and then getting into, then get into retail. Cause it's going to be really important for you to have that brand equity prior mm-hmm. to getting into retail so that you're able to drive your consumer there. However, I got the opportunity to pitch to major retailers a couple of months into owning my brand. That, it was so fast. And I certainly was going to ask you about that. <laughs> so because of that, I knew that if I said yes to one of those opportunities, I would not have the, um, the email list and the grand social media following that I would have normally recommended to someone prior mm. to entering into retail. So for me, I said, their options on the table are invest in a PR agency invest in influencers or go do the, what I think is a little bit inauthentic is buy the followers and buy the email list. 
That helps nobody. And, You're just and buying so, bots. They're not going to buy yeah. from you. <laughs> so very early on, I ended up investing in PR, who also also runs my influencer um, as well. Mm-hmm. And it's a BIPOC owned PR agency called Disrupt. And they were very, very incremental uh, or instrumental, excuse me, in um, creating that brand awareness up front. So I knew that I didn't have the so I think when I launched in retail, I maybe had 2000 Instagram followers and even less email subscribers. Mm-hmm. And I knew that what, that was a buyer, I guess, putting on your buyer hat. What kind of stats would you have expected one of your emerging brands to have had? Yeah, Is 2000 you know, enough? I will tell you this as a buyer, there was always four things that I was looking for. Do you have sales traction somewhere? So do you have traction on your website? Do you have traction on independent stores? Somewhere do you have some sales traction? Mm-hmm. The second thing would be, what is your, your um, social following? So if you don't have a mint social, you know, sales traction yet, do you have people that like believe in what you're trying to do? Mm-hmm. And then I would say the third thing is, do you have an amazing story? Um, and, you know, I want to be the buyer that breaks you. And then the last thing is, if none of those things hold true, or if some of those things hold true, do you really cater to a niche that it's that my assortment is missing? Mm-hmm. And so I think that what benefited be rooted is that we really cater to a niche that was missing in their assortment. And so even though maybe some of those other things were lacking because there was that true white space, that's mm-hmm. why we got the nod to get the opportunity. Um, but kind of to go back to your original question mm-hmm. is it was truly that upfront investment. And I was paying for PR influencer before I was even really making the sales to keep up with paying a PR influencer. Mm-hmm. But I knew that that upfront investment would pay dividends that if I started to build some traction prior to the launch, I would already have somewhat of a recognition with the editors so that when I was able to go into that target launch, they weren't just hearing about me for the first time. Mm-hmm. They had already started hearing about me through holiday and they would get excited about this news. And so I knew the upfront investment will hopefully pay off. And I, and I think it worked. I think so too. But what was that upfront invest- investment? If we're thinking about budgeting and allocating our money for lunch, how much do you allocate towards the PR and influencer effort? Yeah. So you know, not to speak directly to the rates of the agency that I worked with, but because I, I did um, I did interview several different agencies up front. And so what I would tell brands is that for anyone just getting started out, if you're working with a smaller agency that's, you know, typically dedicated to working with smaller brands, mm-hmm. they're looking for anywhere between like two and a half to four thousand a month. Okay. And then once you become a bigger agency or once you become a bigger brand or like a medium sized brand, you know, PR agencies can go anywhere between like, you know, four to 10, depending on where you are. Mm. So when you're thinking of even on the lower end, you know, 2000, that's a fair amount of spend, (laughs) Mm -hmm. especially if you're not quite generating that much in sales yet. So you're digging out of your nine to five pocket. Yeah. And, and so you just have to really decide, you know, what's important to you. And I think that's mm. the beauty around marketing is that there's so many different levers on the spoke of, you know, what you can do to help drive your awareness and promotion strategy. And I wasn't at that point able to have all things firing, but I felt very passionately that because of where I was and where I knew I was going, that PR and influencers was the place that I should focus on. Mm. So when it came to influencers, what were you, what was your ask of them? Who were you approaching from an influencer perspective? So up front, it was very much so just gifting. So, Mm. hey, and, you know, and finding, I think it's really important to be authentic and defining the approach in which, you know, you can't just go, you know, have a list of a hundred people and say, hey, here's my product. Will you please post me? You have to find that connection. And so we spent a lot of time up front thinking about a strategy, like, who are celebs or, you know, macro level influencers who always talk about self-care, who, who, which one of them's already have a passion for journaling, which Mm -hmm. one of them's already, you know, have a passion for supporting black owned businesses. And so 
you know, I think for any brand, if you're out there kind of trying to consider how to go after your influencer strategy, if you're looking for someone to do it on a gifting basis and, you know, and having them post in their stories or on their feed, you have to take the time to figure out what that connection is. Um, I find that you're able to get much more um, people saying yes, if you mm. tie it into something that's already important to their their values. Mm. Okay, that's fair. I think if you do the scattershot method, people are either not going to respond to you and you wasted your effort, or you will find people that are not aligned and the people they bring your way are not your ideal mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. um, but earlier, I think we alluded to the fact that your journey into you know, retail shelves was fairly fast. So people listening now who are trying to do something similar may think, okay, she already had the connections because she's already worked in that industry. That may or may not be the case. You can let us know. But um, for anyone trying to make similar moves, how do you approach it? For example, how do you find the buyers? How do you get their attention? Yeah. So there's kind of two parts there. One is I absolutely have connections in retail. Like I'm not going to say, I'm not going to pretend like that's not true because mm -hmm. of my past experience. But what I will tell you is that the majority of my connections are in beauty. That's where I've spent the majority of my career. So when people found out that I was launching a brand in the home category, they're like, Jasmine, what <laughs> WTF? Like, <Right>. <laughs> we would have definitely thought you would watch the beauty brand. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had never met the major players in that category where I was mm -hmm. launching, like I still had to show up to the, to the meetings, you know, like anyone else that was doing it without any prior connections. I had never met that buyer before. I had never met that buyer's boss before. I had never met mm -hmm. the players in those spaces. And so um, I would say that having the retail background helped me prepare for what was expected Mm. in the meeting. So how to prepare for a line review document, how to ask those right questions. Um, but I don't think it was the thing that like solidified the, the yes, because at the end of the day, these buyers have to be so critical of how they delve out their space mm -hmm. because that space equates to dollars in their pocket. And they are also um, kind of scored on how well they built their assortment strategy. Mm -hmm. But if you're a new brand out there looking to get in front of buyers, I would say one, do it when you're ready. You're never going to feel completely ready, but make mm -hmm. sure that you at least have like, you know, you, you know where you would produce if you got the opportunity, you know how to get barcodes if you got the opportunity, like make sure you have some of that stuff done. But there's three main ways to meet brokers. I mean, three main ways to meet buyers across all categories. The first is there's things called brokers. Brokers are people who have their ear to the ground on the up and coming brands and they kind of soft pitch you to buyers up front. And so that's what happened when I launched is a couple of brokers reached out and said, hey, I actually know that this buyer is looking for a brand that's mm. doing exactly what you're doing. Do you want me to soft pitch them on your behalf? So I wasn't, I was actually too scared to go into retail that early. Like I wasn't even mm. necessarily seeking it at first because I didn't think I was ready. Um, the second way is trade shows. So within every category, there's typically common trade shows that mm. buyers attend. Now it's, we're in a virtual weird world right now, but look those up for your category. So if you're in beauty, you know, there's Cosmoprof. If you're in food and you're in a natural space, um, there's a big one that happens in California every year that's blanking my mind right now. But there's there's the um, the big um, kitchenware show that is in Chicago. Like there's these huge shows where buyers are actually going and looking and spending their whole weekend mm -hmm. finding brands. And then uh, I wouldn't say the last place, but the one that the last one that I'll note is, is a company called Range Me. Range Me is a platform where you can upload your products, your branding, your pricing. All of this and several major retailers type in keywords to find specific brands. So they might be saying like, I'm looking for a natural deodorant brand. And so all the natural deodorant brands will pop up and they'll kind of filter through your profiles. So kind of treat that as like a matchmaking kind of mm -hmm. um, platform. The dating but app those for are, products and buyers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are kind of the three ways that I would say recommending for people to do. There's obviously, you know, you can cold call or cold email um, mm -hmm. buyers, I would say that doesn't work 
that often. But um, those would be the three ways I would recommend you approaching it. I like that you mentioned that the buyers also have a scorecard that they're getting rated on. So from a kind of a an entrepreneur's perspective, what are some of the KPIs that you need to hit every month that you are asking your emerging brands to hit in order for them to maintain that shelf space? Because it's one thing to get in, but it's entirely another to stay on the shelves. Yeah. Um, the main one is productivity, which can look different by retailer, but it's typically um, looked at as dollars per store per week or units per store per week. Mm. So when you look at units per store per week, it's literally, you know, if you sold a thousand units and you're in, you know, 500 stores for that week, that would be you sold two units per store per week. Mm -hmm. And so each one of them have their own thresholds of like what is deemed as good for their category. Mm. Um, some retailers also have a called um, it's productivity per foot. So it's literally looking at how much space you're taking up on the shelf. And they have a metric of how many dollars you need to produce per that space you're taking up on shelf. So mm. it really just depends by the retailer, but it's typically some type of productivity metric that is king for the retailer. Ooh, so you got to keep on working once you get in there. We're, getting in there is not the goal. Staying seems to be oh, the, the goal you should yeah. hit for. Getting in there is, I don't want to say easy because it's absolutely not easy, but it's maintaining and then growing. Mm. That becomes the, the hustle once you're in. So speaking of growing, you launched with a set amount of products. Where are you trying to take the Be Rooted brand? Yeah, you know, ideally, I want Be Rooted to be the go-to stationary brand for women of color across all categories within stationary. So we launched with journals because that's where we launched our website with. But I hope that you guys will see us over the next couple of years really expand across more categories so that when you are looking to set up your office or you're heading back to school, that you're able to have a full Be Rooted assortment to take with you. Oh, that's exciting. And are you planning on expanding beyond Target as you grow as a company? You know, that's a really good question. You know, I'm constantly trying to figure out and determine our distribution model to make sure that we're growing strategically mm -hmm. in a way that we are keeping up with where our customers want to see us, but where we're also keeping up with the cash flow that we're bringing in to be able to support our retailers in a very good way. And so there's a, just a balance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't say yes to everything because saying yes to everything can get you broke, but you also want to make sure that you are placed in the places where your customers are looking for you and want to buy from you. And right now, Target is definitely the priority as um, they are, you know, as we did a lot of research, they're where our customers are buying, they are where, uh, who's really leaning into the multicultural consumer anyways. Yes, they are. Um, so they're our priority for right now, but, you know, more to come more to come. Well, Jasmine, I really appreciate you sharing your journey with us. And for anyone that wants to follow it and support, where can we find you? Yeah. So you can follow us at Be Rooted Co on all channels. That's B-E-R-O-O-T-E-D-C-O. If you found my conversation with Jasmine helpful, I want you to know I have over 140 audio episodes you can binge listen to on she'soffscript.com or anywhere else audio podcasts are available. On your way out, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next episode. I release new ones every Thursday. All right, we'll see you right back here for the next one. Bye.